<clears throat> on the way up, I was just reflecting on uh, on trust and what a core ingredient is in uh, in relationships. Trust is you have a trust is a relationship between two people. You have a trust store and a trustee. And so the trust store allows for the trustee to take responsibility for doing something on their behalf. And the trust store cedes control and gives over control to the trustee and trustee is allowed to take responsibility for something, doing something on their behalf. So trust is about control and responsibility and you know, and it, it, this works also in a, a legal context. You have trusts and you have a trustee and a trustor and the trustee is, is empowered to act on behalf of the trustor and it's, a, it's, it's written into law what the trustee is allowed to do and you have a, a trustee guarantor as well where, where somebody watches the trustee to make sure they're doing their job and there's multiple layers of redundancy worked into it so if the trustee doesn't perform their function there's, there's, there's uh, consequences. But anyway, the, the essence of a trust relationship is that there's two people and that gives control over to the other party and on their behalf. So trust is tough. Because if you trust somebody, then do you give them control? And that's, there's consequences to that. Um, somebody can really betray you. Somebody can betray you. And, and there can be real consequences. You know, you can imagine, like, there's some Navy SEAL got accused of rape some years ago in San Diego. San Diego Coronado is like the big Navy SEAL base headquarters. Uh, so, uh, some Navy SEAL got accused of, of rape. I'm not sure how the whole trial, um, what do I want to say, uh, how the whole trial, um, Resolved and what the actual verdict was, but they were asking the, I think the Navy SEALs, one of the guys in his unit. They were asking him to testify against the guy in his unit, and he said, "No, I can't do it." And I put that your girls, you know, potentially was abused, and he said, "You know, you just spent." millions of dollars training me to trust this guy with my life and to be willing to give my life for this person. And then now we get back stateside and all of a sudden I'm supposed to just testify against him. I go, I, I, can't, I can't do it. Hold me in contempt. Do whatever you want. You get the point? It's like, you think about the trust between people in the military. Like, I'm going to go through this door I'm going to trust you to flank me, like, like watch my flank, watch my six, to make sure somebody doesn't kill me. i got to be focused on what's right in front of me, so I can't be peripherally focused. What's going on, man? Whatever, let's turn it off. I can't be peripherally focused. I gotta be focused right in front of me. So I'm gonna trust you with my life. 
if somebody wants to creep up on me from the side or from behind, I'm not going to see it because I'm focused on what's right in front of me. But I'm going to trust you with my life that you're going to watch my six. Does it get any more like... It's, that's, that's trust with severe responsibility, like, like, like severe consequences. Like, like a, you know. And then you, you, you have people who are trained to trust each other on that level, and then you never betray that person. The level of trust between you is such, you'd never betray that person. Is that Aurora? Sit where I can see you. You'd never betray that person. You just, you know, how are you going to do that? That's why a lot of times, you know, like the spouses can't be forced to testify against each other. Parents can't be forced to testify against children. There's certain relationships, we, it's just acknowledged, hey, you know what? We, it's like there's too much trust here. Between you guys, we can't ask you to betray that trust. And so the, the Navy SEAL, about his, I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong. I'm not trying to make a, I'm just trying to highlight the, nature of trust the Navy SEAL with his partner it, it was it was like you're asking me to go against my mother or go against my child or go against my spouse which is how am I supposed to do that I've, I've been trained to give my life for this person and so you know they say in, in the, like people don't die for causes they die for the guy next to them so you send people to battle, you train people to depend on, trust, count on, and be obliged to their fellow soldiers. And then you go out into battle and it's, you're fighting to keep your fellow soldiers alive more than for some great abstract cause like freedom and justice in the American way. It's much more visceral than that. It's the guy standing next to you who you know is family and you know him and you care about him or you care about her and you're giving your life for those people as opposed to somebody else of some, some abstract principle. You follow? Anyway, I just want you guys to feel like, like how heavy trust is. And it's the most natural thing in the world to trust somebody because no one is an island unto themselves. And we all got to sleep sometime. And somebody's got to look over us while we sleep. And so we can't tend the fire 24-7. Somebody's got to tend the fire while we relax. We can't have eyes in the back of our heads. Somebody's got to watch our six in life. We're social mammals. We're designed to live in a pack and work in a group and be a part of a tribe. And the essence of a tribe or a pack or any group is trust between the group's members and a division of responsibilities and a trusting relationship where different members of the group do different things at different times. In the simplest form, you know, I sleep and you stay awake and make sure no, no wolves come to attack. I sleep and you make sure to feed the fire so we don't freeze to death. We do more complicated versions of it in society. But the essence of it is that I can't do it all. So I find people, we make a connection, and I, I, I give you my heart, I give you responsibility. And I can sleep, I can close my eyes and be peaceful because I know you're watching my back. This makes sense? Yeah. It might be. I can give you a version of it maybe that, 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 that is like easier to, to wrap your head around, but you could imagine if you are you know um, cooking a meal, an important meal, it has to get cooked or studying for a test. You're studying with somebody, and your job is to, you know, master chapter three, and their job is to master chapter four, and you got to pass both chapter three and chapter four to get your, your grade, and they're in charge of making a, the 
index cards for chapter four and you're in charge of making index cards for chapter three and you, there's not enough time for you to study both chapters yourself so you depend on them to read that chapter distill the information and write down on index cards you do your job you trust they're going to do their job and then you guys trade notes and you guys teach each other and you're able to do more than you can do on your own it's just, it's just, it's the way everything gets done. It's the way you clean a building. It's the way you cook a meal. You know, I was rushing in here to get to class. And I, so I told Covey, walk your mom in. Because, you know, Covey's, he's young, 120 pounds. But the dude's a straight savage. I'd probably take Covey over most of you guys in the room. If I like pick somebody, like I'd probably take Covey over most of you guys. I in a straight scrap, I'd probably choose Covey over most of you guys. Maybe not every single one of you, but definitely most of you. He's the number one ranked wrestler in the state, but a year ago I wouldn't ask him to walk my wife in. I would have done it myself. But he's finally in the age where I, he can handle business. And so then I ran out and I said, hey, walk your mom in. Like it's just it's 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 like it's all pervasive trust. It's intrinsic to human life. It's intrinsic to civilization. It's intrinsic to any family unit, any group, any unit, any organized unit, any in, like you know informal or formal unit, any group of people anywhere at any time. The the essence of that of the group is certain trust in between those members even if it's like we all trust I mean like uh, some guy got his neck broken in San Diego just got awarded 46 million dollars because his uh, the guy he was ro wrestling with rolled over his shoulder and his neck was jacked the wrong way and he rolled over his neck and and uh, broke his neck became what's called an incomplete paraplegic where he still had some motion in his four limbs taught himself how to walk again. He got $46 million, but I mean, obviously, it wasn't worth what he went through. The child had been hush-hush for years and years, but they finally released the footage and released the verdict. Um, even if you're training wrestling or jiu-jitsu, you gotta trust the guy you're with not to break stuff. I was wrestling with my son today, and he kept like rolling wildly when I would get him in a leg lock, and I had to keep letting go because he was gonna break his own knee. But he didn't know what he was doing. He was just spastically moving around. So I had to keep loosening up on my grip while he rolled spastically and then tightening it up again. And then I took because he didn't know he was digging when he should have zagged. He didn't know how to, he didn't know how to, you know, what he was doing. You like, you got to trust people. It's like, it's like every single thing you're doing with other people involves trust. In some ways, not knowing this, you don't know why you feel uncomfortable and and you don't know why you feel vulnerable, and you don't know why you feel exposed. But if you understand this principle of trust, and then when you start to feel exposed or uncomfortable, you realize, oh, what am I trusting this person with, and should I not be trusting this person with this thing? And what's making me uncomfortable? Why am I out on a limb in a way I shouldn't be? Should I not be trusting this person with this aspect of my life? Am I too far out on a limb? And of course, if you had a rough childhood and your parents weren't there for you, then you're going to have trust issues and you're not going to want to trust people who are worthy of trusting. And you're going to doubt people who are worthy of trusting. But then, like they say, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. <laughs> and so... Just because you may have trust issues doesn't mean that you should just trust everybody because there's a lot of people out there who don't deserve to be trusted. Now you got to learn how to differentiate between your own trust issues and then people who legitimately don't deserve to be trusted. And welcome to adulthood. Welcome to a successful life. If you can learn, hey, not to shoot yourself in the foot because of your trust issues and at the same time not to be gullible and just trust anybody and everybody. You guys, you getting it now? Trying to flesh this out for you guys. And this isn't just for romantic relationships either. It's for platonic relationships as well. In fact, there's a lot more platonic relationship trust going on than romantic because usually you've got one person you're romantically connected to, but you've got a whole bunch of people you have a trusting relationship with that are platonic. 
And so this is just as important in, 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 in platonic as well as romantic relationships. In a family unit, with your parents, with your children, with teachers. You trust your teacher to know the information, to convey it to you in a way, to, to really to take responsibility for making sure you've understood it. A lot of times we pay people, and then we're, it's understood as like a professional level of courtesy. Like <clears throat> bodyguards in the U.S. Bodyguards in the U.S. are chosen professionally. You pay them money, and then the idea is they're going to kill themselves, die to protect you because they're professionals, and that's what they do. If you go to most old world countries, like let's say Africa, the typical old world country, then they hire their relatives as, as bodyguards. It's like your cousin and your uncle and your brother, they become your bodyguards. But they're not professional bodyguards, but then you send them to school and they learn how to be bodyguards. But why do you have your relatives be your bodyguards? Because you can't trust people for money because somebody else could pay them more money. And then, you know, in a, in a kind of a system where that kind of corruption is, is overt and it's on the surface, then what do you do? You pick family members because the higher likelihood you can trust them. Even they might not be professionals, they'll take a bullet for you, and that's, that, that needs to be there. So, life is trust. Progressive life is trust. Any social bond is trust. Any unit, any group is trust. Even like if we're all into jujitsu, then we trust we're all going to show up and train and look after each other. Even if it's just a special interest group, there's still trust within that group that the members are going to pursue the values of that group and, and look after the other members who are also pursuing the values of that group. You do a kirtan, you trust the guys you're with to play the instruments nicely, to sing along with you. If you have to trust broken, and there's a few, maybe a few different flavors of how you get your trust broken, but if you have to trust broken when you're younger, then you grow up with difficulty trusting people. And you always feel like you have to have one foot out the door. Sometimes independent of having trust issues because somebody broke your trust in a, in a significant way when you were younger, sometimes we're just afraid people might betray us, maybe because they're not worthy of our trust. And, and so sometimes you even set yourself up for feeling like, oh, these people aren't going to be there. And you, you tell yourself it's going to fail and that weak link is going to give and they're not going to, they're not going to um, perform you, ahead of time. You tell, oh, they're probably going to betray me. They're probably not going to stick around. Why would somebody do that? Why would somebody give themselves that narrative? even independent of trust issues. Like somebody's going to betray them. Why would you do that? Yeah? It hurts less. It hurts less. I mean, it, it's, it's a weird thing, but if you say you can, you can predict it, you feel like you controlled it because you predicted it, as opposed to I'm really hoping this works out and I don't know. That like acknowledgement that I have no control over this, and I'm truly in a vulnerable position. Nobody likes to live with that. So you sort of like sandbag and you say, yeah, I know they're probably not going to do the right thing. Yeah, I knew it all along. And then when it doesn't work out, you're like, yeah, I knew it. It hurts a little less. But what's really going on is you're just trying to maintain that control. You only give up that control. But the nature of trust is it involves giving up control. If you ultimately retain control, then you didn't really trust the person anyway. Maybe you half allowed them to do something, but you were helicoptering around them to make sure they performed, and you might as well have just done it yourself. Real trust means you let go, and they have power, and you don't in that regard. But man, the synergy and what you can get done with a group of trusted people, it's spectacular. It's extraordinary, amazing. And so if you can't 
find people to trust, cultivate trusting relationships, you're really living an impoverished life. And if you can, you're rich, irrespective of what's in your bank balance. To have people around you you can trust, to be a part of a tribe of people you can trust, people who take a bullet for you, people that you would die for them and they'd die for you. That's a life worth living. That's a human being at their, like, like at a high potential, like, like a thriving. And that's even independent of what your value system is. Your value system is a whole other conversation, but independent of how good or bad your value system is, just to have other people that you share that with, that you can trust, that have your back, that you can depend on, you sleep good at night. You feel loved. Really trust is love. Right? Trust and love are like, you know, married together. Sometimes it's like this professional trust relationship, stuff like that. But when you really talk about trust in your life, the people you trust the most are the people who love you the most. It's deep enough you can trust in it. So trust and love are like, they're practically speaking synonymous. And then ultimately, faith in Krishna, faith in God, an act of faith, not like just a question of do you believe, but faith really translates to trust. Do you trust Krishna to have your back? Do you trust Krishna's looking out for your best interest? Prabhupada, was, his health was failing in 1977. The devotees asked Prabhupada, can we pray to Krishna to save you? And Prabhupada said, you can pray, my dear Lord Krishna, if you so desire. Please let Srila Prabhupada recover. But he had to throw that if you so desire caveat in there because he didn't want to tell Krishna what to do because he trusted Krishna. We trust people in this world, we deal with our trust issues, we try and grow, grow up and grow beyond them and learn to discern who's trustworthy and who's not and live a progressive life of increasing trust. But then ultimately, the finale is you start to think about the Creator. You start to work on cultivating trust for your Creator. It's like high level trust. Krishna is so remote, he's abstract, it's more difficult to trust Krishna. He's right in front of you. But the, the idea of Krishna, at least in the beginning, is extremely abstract. And so then the place of trusting Krishna is more difficult. It's more theoretical, it's more hypothetical. It's more remote, more abstract, more conceptual. That changes as you advance in spiritual life, at least in the beginning, it's like that. And so we kind of build, and you know, hopefully you do things are with your parents, you gotta go back and fix that, and you start to trust people, and then you start to work on trusting Krishna, and really trusting Krishna we have a name for that, just like trust in this world translates as love, and trusting Krishna translates as? Faith. Bhakti. I think in many ways you could distill down bhakti as trusting Krishna. I'll do my part, Krishna, I'll chant, I'll follow, and I trust you to do your part, that you're going to hold me in your hand and help me navigate life. Bhakti is really 
loving Krishna, and loving Krishna is really trusting Krishna. Also, being trustworthy. <laughs> like, hey, Krishna, you can count on me. I'll do my part. We have a relationship. I'm not going to fail you. I have a responsibility to you also. I'm going to do my duty. So bhakti, in many ways, boils down to trust, which is synonymous with love. And I think this is the essence of human life. I used to think, you know, when I was looking at myself, and what makes me tick, what I'm looking for in life. And that gives you a hint. What you're looking for in life gives you a hint at, at where you might be exploitable. That thing which you need that has the potential to control you. Somebody gives you that thing, then they, they have your, your, your heart in their hand. If you, if you really want to be beautiful and somebody tells you you're beautiful, then you become very, very indebted to that person and they can control you through that. If you really value money and somebody dangles money in front of you, they dangle money in front of you, they can, they can use it to manipulate you. So I'm thinking of what makes me tick. I'm really looking for loyalty, integrity, depth, but ultimately, I'm looking for people I can trust, if you want to distill it down to a word. People will be there for me, I'll be there for them. I'm looking for that connection. And I always thought that was unique to me. You know, I've always felt like that since I was a kid. I wanted to be able to trust my best friends. I wanted to be able to trust the people I was around. And that was such a big deal for me, to be able to trust somebody. And I was always looking for people that would like, like take a bullet for me, I'd take a bullet for them. I think I was attracted to gangs because there was that that promise, that value. Even though you know, the other value system was all screwed up, at least that value was there, this loyalty to the point of death. And I always thought that was specific to me and it was kind of part of what made me tick and it differentiated me from other people. But as I'm getting older, I'm starting to think actually, no, I think maybe I'm, I'm a little insightful. Maybe I have some insight into this subject, some kind of unique or less common insight. But I think everybody's ultimately looking for people they can trust. I think what I thought made me unique or different or what was my thing, I think it's everybody's thing. And I think if you're not looking for people to trust, it's just because you've got trust issues and so you're trying to control it by not admitting that you're actually looking for people to trust. But I think ultimately, once we get over your trust issues, and once we get over your inability to admit that you don't want to lose control, you'll find that every single person on planet Earth, every single human being, is ultimately looking for people they can trust. That is the project of human life. That's what every human being is looking for. A tribe, a sense of belonging. And a tribe in the sense of belonging means people they can trust who can also trust them. I, it's, just, it's just as important for you to trust me as it is for me to be able to trust you. If I can just trust you, I'm like a child, you're my parent. But if I first act, actually have like a, like, a, like a meaningful adult relationship, I have to be able to trust you and you have to be able to trust me. And being trustworthy in your eyes, that's just as important as being able to trust you. And then, the old, as I'm getting older, I'm starting to think, you know what, it's, it's actually not specific to me. This is what everybody's looking for. This is the essence of humanity. And if you don't think it's the essence of humanity, well, then you just told me that you have massive trust issues. So much so, you can't even admit to yourself that that's what you're looking for. And you're sandbagging yourself left and right in a vain attempt to try and keep control, which you can't keep anyway. And by owning it, what we're looking for and what we need and what everybody needs and what it means to be a human being, it gives you some insight and it lets you know, hey, this is the project I need to work on. I need to become trustworthy. I need to also learn to discern who's worthy of trust and, 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 and then create trusting relationships in my life. And of course, it's not also, also not, you know, there's not just one type of trust. Sometimes you trust people in one area of your life and another area of your life. 
But ultimately, that, what you really want is just people you know are going to have your back. That's why it's important not to talk crap about people that you care about behind their backs. Because it means you're not trustworthy. That's why I always make it a point, if you guys ever hung out with me, you'll know if I do talk about somebody behind their back, I always say, and you can tell that person I said that, and then usually the next day I go and call the person, hey, I was talking about yesterday, I said this. People are like, why are you calling me? Tell me, ah, oh, because I said it, and I don't want you to hear from anybody else. I figured you'd hear it from me. That way, at least you know. I mean, people go, oh, two crumbs said this about you. They're like, no, he didn't. Because he always calls me every time he says something. He tells me exactly what he says. He didn't say that. Like somebody told me today what Kumi said. I was like, ah, it's not what no, I was like, I don't think so. And I called Kumi, I'm like, did you say this? It wasn't about me, it was about third party. She was like, no, I didn't say that. And I was like, ah, that's, that's what I thought. I just got her on a three-way call and said, did you say this? No. Yeah, I figured. What did you say? I said this. I asked, see you twisted her words. And it's, it's, like, it's like, it's a great place to be when somebody can tell you how so-and-so is talking this and that about you. And you're like, yeah, I don't think so. That's my, that's my, that's it's my guy. Hey, it's not talking like that. You're a liar. You're a, you're a pot stir. That's what you are. As opposed to, oh man, like I got betrayed again. Another person, another foul of a soldier talking about me behind my back. So as we, we want to, it's just as important as trusting people is being trustworthy. And that it takes commitment. You have to develop. You have to become a better caliber of human in order to be trustworthy. And ultimately, all of this stuff we do in this world, when you just apply that to Krishna, and you view Krishna as a person that you have a real relationship with, the entire thing just transfers right over, and bhakti is the gradual process of learning to trust Krishna, which is synonymous with loving Krishna. And because you're dealing with an omnipotent, omnibenevolent being, then it means you really turn your life over to Krishna and really put yourself in his hands. And you have faith. He's going to look out for you. And there's a confidence that happens. You're confident, like a child when they're in front of their parents. I remember being seven. So we're talking like 1979. And my grandmother, my step-grandmother, she owned a cool little department store in, uh, in Santa Monica. It was back in the day when it wasn't all like J.C. Penney's and Zodies and Sears, we had these like little department stores. There's one in Westwood too, Bullocks. You guys ever been to Bullocks? It's in Westwood. I don't know if it got shut down, but it was a department store. So like there used to be these department stores and it wasn't just a massive mega franchise chain. There were like, like Walmarts and Targets everywhere. There were small independently owned department stores. This is before all you guys' time. So anyway, she owned a little department store. And I was there, like, picking up a jacket. You know, like, I mean, you think, like, oh, my grandma was the department store. I could just go in there and just mob the place and get whatever I want. But it wasn't like that. They were rich but stingy. So it was like, you know, like once a year for my birthday or Christmas, they'd, like, let you go in and get, like, one item or something like that. So I think it was Christmas time, and I got this cool OP jacket. And it was, like, an OP like puffy jacket and it was two-tone brown and tan and it was like brown corduroy on the top like so came down like into like a little like almost like a like a like a like a cowboy shirt you know where like like this like as it kind of comes down like it kind of comes to a point here and it kind of comes up and like that and then it was like tan puffy material on the bottom. You guys follow this? With a big old corduroy collar. OP. A 
funny thing is that jacket right now would be super retro and it would be like en vogue but I remember when that jacket came out and it was just cutting edge contemporary wear like it never been done before like that was the cool style like people are like hang tent socks and pull them up to their knees and bands and then that kind of sh and that's like they're like I'm going retro right but I was a kid and that stuff was cutting edge which is wild, you know? 80s fashion is coming back now. I think that's a mistake. I think the 80s just needs to like die an ignoble death. There's nothing meritorious there. And then you bring back, we don't need to bring back shoulder pads, you know? It's just like, it's just, let it die, you know? It's like somebody dies of a plague. It's just like, leave the body, don't touch it, you know? Um, But then I was driving. I, I, I haven't told this story like, in my entire life. But I was driving my mom back from the, this, and I can't remember the name of it. So I gotta figure, I gotta call my brother and ask him the name of it. And that was, it was on like Broadway and maybe like 4th Street or something like that. Um, and then we were coming up 4th Street. To Santa Monica Boulevard, we could make a right turn to go to my dad's office, which was between 5th and 6th Street on Santa Monica Boulevard. And then my mom, like some homeless dude, came like walking across in the middle of the street. My mom had to sign on brakes. And he like slammed his fist on the, on the, uh, the hood of her car. And then she had a green Oldsmobile. It was back in the day. Like, nobody has green cars anymore. Like, it used to be like cars weren't just black and white and gray. Like the majority of cars you saw on the street used to be colored. Green or blue or red. And like, and like, and like exciting colors. You look at like the, you know, the like Detroit, like muscle cars. They had like this whole epic Mopar colors, you know? Um, so anyway, she had a green Oldsmobile. Slammed his fist down on the hood of the car. I think he came by the driver's side window, just cussing her out like anything. And I remember in the back, just feeling like it would really rip me apart. I mean, we're talking, you know, whatever that is, 43 years ago, I can still remember it. But I remember feeling like my mom was unprotected and I couldn't do anything to protect her. So there's that, like I want to be able to protect somebody. But there's also just this recognition that my parents weren't in, like powerful. And my mom wasn't powerful. And somebody could come and overwhelm my mom. And like, like there's like nothing she could do about it. Like I, I think prior to that time I thought my mom was really powerful. And I felt so much confidence when I was around my parents, but at a certain point I realized, oh my parents actually are fallible soldiers, they can't protect me. And it's like a little bit like a little bit of your innocence, a little bit of your trust, a little bit of your confidence dies in situations like that. Krishna's not like that. Krishna just like your trust in Krishna expands without limit. He's truly your friend, philosopher, and God. He's truly your well wisher. He truly loves you and he's omnipotent, so he can always do what's right for you and look out for you and help you. So whereas with people in this world, there may be limits to how much we can trust them. With Krishna, with Krishna's representatives even, your trust can expand without limit. And so although it may be more abstract, it may be more remote, and you may have to build up to it and work up to it, it may be harder to do. Ultimately, it's, it, is, it is the purpose of life. It's to learn to trust, to learn to love, to learn to let go of control, to learn to become trustworthy, to learn to take control and responsibility for other people, and then to take those skills and apply them to Krishna. 
and that's bhakti. I think I'm done. Thoughts? Yeah, loud. I also think that doubts in Krishna are not the opposite of faith. Usually faith and doubts are seen as antonyms. I'm pretty sure if you got out of the dictionary and you looked up doubt and antonym, faith and faith antonym would be doubt. It's probably the primary antonym. But I think doubts are totally congruent with faith. And just like in a relationship when you're starting out, there's some faith, but then you've got to work through doubts for that faith to become stronger. And there's like an initial level of faith, an initial level of intrigue, an initial level of trust. But to upgrade to the next level of trust, you then have to deal with your issues, which means you have to work through doubts. And so to move from a surface level, low level, trusting relationship with Krishna to a really deep and profound loving relationship with Krishna, that necessarily involves entertaining doubts and dealing with them. And so we shouldn't look at doubts as necessarily being indicative of a problem. Like, oh, I have doubts, that means I'm not right with Krishna, which is sort of what you were saying. We should more look at doubts as being a necessary step we have to move through in order to upgrade to a higher level of trust. Just like when a relationship goes from dating to going steady, or a casual acquaintance to a real friend. That make sense? It was good feedback, huh? It's like, damn, that was good feedback. <laughs> Kumi? Yeah, thank you. That was really insightful. Um, I was wondering, you said that love and trust were synonymous, but can you love someone that you don't trust? Yeah, I don't mean they are completely synonymous. I mean they share a tremendous amount of overlap. Theoretically, you could love somebody. I love you. Right? But I don't trust you, which really means I don't think you love me. So in that sense, you can love somebody but not trust them. What you really could say is, I love you and I don't think you love me in the same way. So in that sense, they are actually fully synonymous. In other words, what you thought was an instance where you love somebody but don't trust them, you thought that was indicative that love and trust are not synonymous, it's actually not, because what you're really saying is, I love you, but I don't believe that you love me in the same way. <laughs> you can trust me, but I don't think I can trust you. And so you're actually, the, the way you said that was using the word in exactly the same way, as exactly synonymous. But I do think, for example, I could professionally be trustworthy as a matter of just my professionalism. You paid me a certain amount of money, and I'm going to do something to look out for you. But I have no love for you. You follow? So that would be an instance where trust and love were not the same. I was just pointing out to the tremendous amount of overlap and how in many of our lives, especially in our intimate and close personal dealings, uh, they are actually synonymous. And so I maybe was a bit hyperbolic, but I, so I troubleshot it in my mind, but I wanted to convey that point that for the most part they are. In, in most, m most people's lives, although we could theorize situations, right? I mean, here's an interesting question for you. Could you love somebody but not be trustworthy? Could I say I love you but you shouldn't trust me? Maybe, but like how deep is that love? Is it really love? Or is it just like I have some feeling for you? If you want to say I, I love you, does that mean you can trust me? Like, I really love you. Does that mean you can really trust me? It kind of does, doesn't it? Anyway, I, I, I thought there was some value in thinking along these lines because I felt it's very, like you said, insightful. It's quite revealing of like what actually is going on in the world and what's making the world tick and how we're, why we feel the way we do about situations. Why things affect us the way they do. More. Yeah. So how you mentioned how soldiers 
Narayan is a captain in the army who's done multiple tours in the Middle East. And anyway, continue. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, to fully flesh out what I meant, I would say this. I think there, that people do die for causes and give their life for causes and for the person standing next to them. It's really not either or. It's really both. And so as we are learning to love Krishna, who may be remote and abstract, it starts out by us loving the devotees. And so those two things aren't mutually exclusive. And in fact, one you know, kind of springboards to the other and they mutually nourish one another and they're not at all uh, antagonistic towards one another. They fit together perfectly like a hand in the glove. One is more immediate, it's more visceral, it's more obvious, it's easier to attain, that's the person in front of you. And then the other one is more remote and it takes more cultivation and more depth, but you can get there and they don't, n- n- one doesn't replace the other. And so when you do die for a cause, you're also dying for the other people who are there who also will die for that cause. And the, the, the camaraderie you feel with them and the identity you feel with them who also share your belief in that cause just skyrockets that limit because now you have this incredibly deep thing in common with them. I thought of all that when I said what I said. I just didn't like, I didn't want to get jammed up. Same with you. So both these points you, you brought up, the reason why I was able to respond to them was because I actually thought of them as I was speaking. I just didn't, I made a mental decision. I'm not going to take the time to fully flesh it out because it would be tangential. It makes me feel good because it feels like, like we're on the same page. And it, it speaks to what I'm saying, that this is universal because you're having the same exact questions I have because we're really talking about our life. Not some theoretical concept, but it's actually life. Trust. Love, trustworthiness. More? Okay, let's do a little cure time. Thank you.